Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Universe Within podcast. I hope this finds you all well in this new year of 2023. Um, To start, uh, I want to introduce a new sponsor. Um, It's my friends over at a company called Real Mushrooms. And uh, sponsorship, it really helps me to bring this show out to the audience and to the to the listeners, you all. Um, when I decided to take on sponsors, I really wanted to make sure that they were in alignment with uh, kind of the thread and the values of this podcast. Um, one of the big things that this podcast focuses on is plant medicine and natural medicine. And really throughout history, throughout antiquity, uh, mushrooms have been one of the the main plant or fungi, fungal uh, medicines uh, really used in in, uh, holistic health and natural health. Um, They've been considered not only really medicines, but teachers as well. And on the medicinal front, um, they they have a whole list of uh, therapeutic uses for for human health and longevity. Um, In in many ancient cultures, there's a long history of working with uh, medicinal mushrooms. Um, and really there's now a, a really big growing body of scientific evidence that, that really supports uh, the claims of many different therapeutic and health benefits of mushrooms. Um, mushrooms are something I've worked a lot with uh, in the past with medicinal mushrooms, things like reishi, chaga, turkey tail, lion's mane, uh, cordyceps, uh, and I'm a really big fan. I'm a really big proponent of them. Um, and so I was really excited when uh, the guys at Real Mushrooms agreed to come on board. Uh, Jeff, who I interviewed in episode 81, um, works with them, and also his son, Sky, who I hope to interview in the near future. Um, they're a really good company, uh, really good guys, and um, you know, for better or for worse, the the supplement industry is really loosely regulated, uh, so you often uh, don't really know what you're getting. Um, if you're lucky, you're getting a good product. If you're not so lucky, you may be getting very little of the purported product. In some cases, maybe uh, nothing at all. Um, this is definitely the case with mushrooms, um, and uh, unlike some of the other big mushroom companies, uh, Real Mushrooms uses uh, pure mushrooms, which I think is really important. Some of the other big companies companies actually use uh, mycelium that's uh, grown on grain and then those two things are blended together and that ends up in the final product. So with real mushrooms, you're getting 100% pure mushrooms. Um, So again, I was really happy they came on board, uh, really happy to promote their product. They're they're two really good guys, really good company. Uh, So if you're interested in medicinal mushrooms, uh, check out their website at realmushrooms.com. And also listeners to this receive 25% off their first order. So I will put a link to that in the show notes. My guest for today is Chris Killam. I met Chris uh, probably three years ago, maybe, maybe even four years ago, uh, when I was working at the Amazonian Plant Medicine Center, the Temple of the Way of Light. Uh, Chris came down with Zoe, his wife, and uh, they did a really interesting workshop, um, and I got to know them a little bit there. Chris is a really fascinating guy. Uh, He's also known, as he says, as the medicine hunter, and he's traveled around the world uh, working with different local and indigenous communities, um, uh, really discovering and learning about their local medicinal plants, uh, and he really brings those out to the public. Uh, He he shares a lot of information. He's been on a lot of different shows. Um, He's written a number of really good books. Uh, uh, One is a really popular book called The Ayahuasca test pilots handbook, um, kind of about the preparatory recommendations of working with medicines like ayahuasca. Uh, He recently wrote a book on um, the the interlacing of yoga and cannabis, which uh, is very interesting. And he's really just a big proponent of uh, medicinal plants on all levels, Uh, things from 
general health to using them for different uh, physical ailments, things like longevity. So he's a really fascinating guy. He's doing really, really good work. Uh, I was really happy to sit down and talk with him. Uh, also, uh, I'm planning to speak with Zoe later on, probably in about a month. So probably in another episode or two, that uh, show should be out as well. So I'm also very excited about that. Uh, but again, it was really a pleasure for me to sit down and have Chris share. And I think and hope you all will really enjoy this episode. As always, if you're able to to support this episode or this podcast, Patreon is a really good option. It's a subscription service. You can sign up for as little as a dollar a month. There's different tiers you can sign up for. Those tiers give you different things back, things like early access to shows, bonus material, Q&As. Uh, that's a really big help to me. It's really what allows me to keep uh, making these podcasts, bringing these guests on. To all of the patrons, to all the people who support via Patreon, as always, thank you very much for your support. And if you are able to join that, uh, that's a really really big help to me. Um, if you are not able to do that, as always, uh, just doing some of the really small things make a really big difference. So if you're listening to this on YouTube or Rumble or Odyssey, uh, subscribing to the show, turning on the notification bell, liking the videos, leaving any questions or comments in the comments section, that's always a really big help. And then with the audio version, uh, if you're listening on um, Spotify or Apple Podcasts, uh, also following subscribing to the show. And with Apple Podcasts, leaving a starred rating and a short review is a really big help. So um, I think that's it. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Chris. Running out from the maze, running out of the maze today. Running out from the maze, running out from the maze, running out from the maze today. Running out from the maze, running out from the maze, run out of the maze today. Well, great, Chris. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, we were just chatting a little bit before we started. Um, I I had been familiar with you for a while. Uh, you had written a number of books that that I think, have especially recently, become quite well known and. Um, you you had spent a lot of time in the Amazon, and I was actually working at a big Amazonian plant medicine center called the Temple of the Way of Light. And uh, and you and uh, Zoe, your 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 wife or your partner, came down, and uh, it, it was really it was really beautiful seeing both of you, seeing seeing yourself, uh, kind of the interaction between you, your your work outside of the Amazon, kind of merging that within the Amazonian framework, and kind of just being this bridge between uh, indigenous cultures and, and kind of the outside world that, that probably a lot of the listeners are, are coming from. So, uh, yeah, just to start, thank you very much for coming on. I, I really appreciate your time. I, I know you're probably a busy man. Um, I would imagine a lot of the listeners have heard of you, and, and I, I would imagine some of them haven't as well. But maybe just to start, if you could uh, give a little bit about your background, who you are, where you came from, and, and what got you started in this this very interesting path that you're on. Sure. Happy to. Thank you so much, Jay. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Okay, we'll try that another time. <laughs> um, I, uh, well, my name's Chris Killam. I'm often known as the medicine hunter. I've been working with medicinal plants and fungi and one way or another since the 1970s, which dates me terribly, but that's just a fact of life. Um, and first got involved with psychedelics specifically in 1967. Um, when I first took LSD, it was still legal. Um, so I think my first three LSD trips were in fact legal trips. And then subsequently, of course, that changed as the hammer fell on all of the psychedelic culture. But I have traveled the world investigating medicinal plants of all different kinds, um, psychoactive, non-psychoactive, spices, food crops, uh, you know, medicinal plants for almost every different kind of health need. And that's taken me all over, um, well, parts of North America and Europe and um, throughout much of Africa and the Middle East and um, Asia, especially India, Thailand, Malaysia, uh, Nepal a bit. And um, 
quite extensively in South America, where I've worked or, or been in the Amazon about 35 times over the course of the last few decades, uh, working on one thing or another. Um, most recently, prior to COVID, completing a two-year uh, project investigating the sustainability of Banisteriopsis copy, the vine that's used to make ayahuasca. I have uh, a bunch of books out, about 16, I guess, or so right now. The Two of the ones that you may have uh, been thinking of when you mentioned my books were the Ayahuasca Test Pilot's Handbook, uh, which is a guide to ayahuasca and to journeying with ayahuasca. And more recently, The Lotus and the Bud, which is about um, cannabis and yoga together. I've been practicing and teaching yoga since uh, 71. Um, so in any case, uh, my my background is really holistic health with a focus on plants and working with indigenous people all over the world. And I do help to establish sustainable trade in botanicals. So, you know, if I'm working with maca growers in the Peruvian Andes and the idea is get them the best deal possible and help to support organic methods of cultivation and, and that kind of thing and help help the communities to grow and thrive and prosper, even as we on the market end, you know, reap hundreds of billions of dollars from these agents. So, um, you know, and, and I some people may know me from my 500 or so TV appearances and traveling with news crews, ABC, NBC, CBS, PBS, CNN, you know, New York Times, Outside Magazine, those kinds of things. So uh, I've been very fortunate to utilize media to tell about these plants, about the fungi, and in many cases about psychedelics in some very unlikely situations, like on the Fox uh, news network where i talked about psychedelics repeatedly in a hundred countries it was it was a phenomenal experience so um that's a little bit of a, a skewed um you know background on me <laughs> so when we before we started recording we, we were talking about this interesting aspect to which uh <laughs> you were saying kind of within this realm of plants and medicine, you, you didn't necessarily just jump into it on, on the more psychoactive end, which I think a lot of times now, interestingly in our cultures, when we talk about plant medicine, people's minds automatically go to, oh, they must be talking about ayahuasca or some hallucinogenic plant. But you actually started with these more uh, kind of for lack of better words, common plants, plants that are used as medicine, as herbs. What what was it that got you interested in that that medicinal quality or, or that that noticing? Because I think for a lot of people, there's even a disconnect uh, between realizing that plants are medicine and and they're 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 right. a daily medicine. Well, you know, it's funny that the term plant medicines is grossly misused and abused and misunderstood by a lot of the psychedelic community. Plant medicines means coffee. It means eucalyptus. It means peppermint. It means rosemary. It means thyme. It means ginkgo. It means echinacea. It means psyllium seed. It means cocoa. It means at least 50,000 plants and innumerable fungi that we know of. Um, plant medicines are definitely not limited to psychoactive or psychedelic medicines at all. Those are subgroups of the much broader range. And what you and I were talking about, my, my opinion is that there's great advantage to having a broader understanding of plant medicines overall, how human beings have co-evolved with these, you know, biologically and even, you know, physiologically over time. And they suit, suit our needs, whether it's something that decongests clogged sinuses or, you know, relieves uh, constipation or, you know, sends you on an eight hour journey out into the screaming abyss. I mean, whatever it is, you know, um, we are biologically suited to respond to plants. Without plants, we couldn't live. There would be no life without plants. We wouldn't breathe. We wouldn't eat. Uh, you know, there would be no life, period. And so I, I do find it advantageous to have a broader base of plant knowledge, though I understand some people, you know, wish to focus on psychedelic uh, plants and fungi specifically, and, and they're certainly welcome to do so. Yeah. When 
When you worked with LSD the first time, and, and I guess, like you said, we can openly talk about it because at that time it was legal. So <laughs> uh, what, what was there something that, that happened in that experience that uh, that you still remember to this day? Well, I mean, you know, sometimes people describe these things as like a, a, a shift in reality or a shift in cosmovision or they, they see something new for the first time. Or was there something there that intrigued you that, that you think a, kind of piqued your oh, yeah. interest in going deeper? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> first, first of all, this was 1967. OK, uh, I was 15. And um, we did not know anything about so-called microdosing, okay? All the LSD that was popular at that time, white lightning, Monterey purple, blue cheer, orange sunshine, speckled barrel, window pane. These were all 270 micrograms per hit. So they were real, you know, dive into the deep end, not dog paddle in the shallow end kind of psychedelics. And... At the time, LSD was very much in the news and people wanted people I knew wanted to know about it. And we were constantly reading, you know, magazine articles and there were news, uh, you know, stories about LSD, usually very um, deprecating stories. You know, this stuff will make you crazy. It'll scramble your chromosomes. You know, you'll have 17 limbed babies. I mean, it went on and on and on. Anything they could throw, anything to make the dirt stick anything they could throw at the wall to try to convince people not to try these things um, was not enough of a counterbalance to things like the doors of perception and, and some other things that were available. So some of my friends and I were eager to try LSD and I got the opportunity to do so. And in response to your question, I mean, first of all, I remember absolutely everything about that day, not just a few things, but, um, you know, this didn't just open the doors of perception for me. It kicked them down and broke the hinges right off of the doorways and splintered the doorways to pieces. And it was this wide gaping hole into another world and a magnificent world, a world of joy and light and energy. And, you know, I had my first dip into real cosmic consciousness, you know, it was suffused with you know, oneness of all things and just kind of bathed in that and, and the dissolution of myself. And, um, you know, I wasn't especially eager to run out and just immediately do it again. I, I wanted to absorb that, but um, it was a beautiful experience and totally profound. And I realized, wow, you know, these crackpots on the news, they're hosing us. A, they've never done this themselves. And B, they don't want to, us to do this because there's nobody who's got any control over this. And so it was a fascinating uh, entry into, I subsequently wound up doing 150 acid trips over a few years with my friends. Uh, you know, I, I loved tripping with friends. I did some on my own, but I really enjoyed it. And, you know, the term working with is kind of funny in a way, Jason. I wasn't working with it. I took acid and I tripped. And the thing about that is that we've drifted so far into this pharma model. We think the only way you can work with, you know, can be with psychedelics is to work with them. And that unquestionably is profoundly beneficial, as you know, from your time at Temple of the Way of Light and, you know, experiencing ayahuasca and being with people who did, you know, that as a medicine in a controlled situation and guided through a process, these agents are profound. They're the greatest healers we have. But <laughs> you can also just play and play naked frisbee on the beach, assuming it's a naked beach and you won't get arrested. You know, you can also just take your dog for a walk. You can also go out into a field and fall down on your back and just laugh at the clouds for four hours. That's also a potentially luminous, mind-blowing, uh, revelatory, life-changing experience. So I, I am an advocate for tripping, uh, not just the ceremonial circumstances in which I've done huge numbers, but um, just plain, you know, putting the blotter on your tongue, eating the mushrooms, swallowing the eye. Well, ayahuasca, you know, you can't really go like out and play on ayahuasca because you'd be, you know, 
puking and maybe crapping yourself. But um, I mean, for the most part, with the psychedelics, you can also just plain trip and derive enormous, enormous life changing benefits. Yeah. You, you mentioned that you have been a, a longtime practitioner of yoga and, and you, you wrote this book on, on kind of the, the, the interaction or the, maybe the dance, the, the history also of, of cannabis and yoga. Can, can you speak a little bit about that? Because I, my sense is that a lot of these religions, and I know this is a, probably a pretty controversial view, but that at, at a root of, uh, a lot of, if not all religions was, was probably some sacramental use of, of plants. Um, but, but this, this interchange uh, between something like yoga and, and how you find that that fits into this world of, of, of plants. Um, and, and also just that idea of cannabis as a plant medicine, because I think a lot of people, you know, cannabis is an interesting thing, it, kind of like LSD you were talking about. It, it used to be really widely known and used, and then for a long time it was demonized. And now it's kind of come back with a vengeance also. But now there's there's maybe kind of the, the opposite worldview that cannabis can cure everything and it's a cure-all and, there, you know, there, there, there's no potential downside to it. So it's a very fascinating plant, and, and it's interesting because in, in some of these indigenous cultures like you're familiar with in the Amazon, they, they often say that the energy of cannabis is, is quite tricky, um, although I, I've also heard it beautifully said that, that cannabis isn't tricky. It's the human mind that's tricky. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, maybe just your thoughts on that because I think that's a, that's a fascinating interplay between yoga and cannabis. Well, I I became intrigued with yoga when I was a little boy. I used to sit in full lotus for long periods of time. I didn't know why. I used to go in front of the TV and get myself into plow pose and watch TV upside down. I have no idea why I did that, but I did it a lot. And, um, you know, yoga, I, I once saw a movie. I think it was a Robert Mitchum movie, and there was a guy in full lotus sitting on a table, and he was in a trance. And I was sitting there. I was like just this little kid, and I went, "I know that somehow. I, I don't know what that is. I know that. I know that thing this guy's doing." Um, and so I had a natural pull to yoga practice, and started in my teens. And um, you know, I've continued practicing daily to this day. It's been uh, 53 years now of daily practice. And um, I also, as a teenager, you know, was introduced to cannabis after LSD. I very first time I ever got high on anything, I did 270 mics of white lightning. And that was that revelatory trip. Um, subsequently, got high on cannabis and said, hey, this stuff is great. <laughs> this is what people are talking about. Um, I did go through many years where I did nothing with yoga practice, but yoga, no psychoactive agents of any kind. Um, but in general, in general what, what I've seen I've that seen there, the, uh, the, is, a, is we're getting an, we're echo. getting an echo. Uh, it's yeah. Feeding back. Let me don't know what, let me that just is. check what that is. from, from your end. It's actually good. But yeah. uh, is that better? Um, let me see. Yeah, now I'm not hearing the echo anymore. Okay. okay. Let's, um, yeah, let's do that. It was looping back and at me. Yeah. So in any case, um, you know, I, I taught for a very, very long time. I, mean, I haven't taught for several years now, but it used to be the case that, you know, I'd go teach yoga at conferences and that kind of thing. And then afterwards, the yoga teachers would get together and get high and we'd go out for dinner. You know, but we kept the cannabis thing separate from the students and, you know, from whoever was running the conference. But we always got high at night. <laughs> That's what we did. And it was a, a nice blend. You know, this was something in our lifestyles anyway. And <clears throat> as uh, this go relates back a, a few thousand years when cannabis arrived in India, it was immediately absorbed into um, spiritual culture as an as a a way to uh commune with the god shiva and to experience that bliss you know without having to uh meditate in a cave for a, a whole bunch of time so it always has had uh relative to the yoga tradition a significant uh, connection 
is cannabis a free ride and nobody has to worry about it and it can do no harm? No, of course not. Um, there's no such thing. You know, you eat 100 apples a day, you'll die. Okay, apples aren't toxic, but you'll die if you eat 100 apples a day. Um, you know, so you want to be um, you want to be careful and um, conscious about your use of cannabis. But in fact, the way the endocannabinoid system, the re receptors in our bodies are set up um, and their relationship to the respiratory system and the nervous system, yoga being a practice of the nervous system after all, um, you know, there's a very good um, mutuality between cannabis and yoga practice. And I had seen, you know, that there were some titles out there on the topic, and I thought that there were areas of both cannabis and yoga that had not been included. And I always like to provide more information, not less. So I decided to write The Lotus and the Bud. And, you know, fortunately, it's been well received. Um, you know, I my best selling yoga book of all time is The Five Tibetans, which is in 28 languages. And that's basically a 12 minute per day practice of five exercises that really infuse you with energy and vitality and help your balance and, you know, pretty much help all organ systems. So my involvement with yoga has been very deep as I've pass, passed through, you know, various uh, psychedelics. And uh, I felt that, you know, I had a background enough to speak to the relationship between cannabis and yoga. How would you describe yoga uh, from you know, your many years of practicing now, because I think yoga is also another one of these topics where people have very different uh, ideas about it. Um, but I'd, I'd be curious to hear what, after years of practice and, and also all these different modalities that, that you've gone through, what your kind of what your understanding of yoga is. My understanding is that yoga is a conscious current that runs through human history and that it calls to us um you know when people say oh i've decided to take up yoga that usually means yoga has decided to take up you um and so i think that this force throughout history is something that we can enter into with a variety of methods and techniques and what i said before about yoga being a practice of the nervous system as we are, in fact, at present incarnate beings, anything we do, you know, we, we interact somehow using our bodies. You know, we eat, we use our taste buds and our gastrointestinal tracts and our metabolism and on and on. Yoga is a practice of the nervous system. Uh, energy in the body flows through the nerves, flows through the plexuses, the nerve bundles uh, that align with the spine that people refer to as the chakras. They're identical, um, you know, and with yoga practice, you learn to tap into that energy, be more aware of that energy uh, and move that energy uh, for a variety of purposes, including expanding consciousness. So uh, I, I understand yoga as a current running through humanity and our participation in it as yoga picking us up as we go along. And, and also, you know, what I think is that we need things that can keep us open and expanded. You know, as we go through our days, we have all this stuff we have to do. I mean, even if it's just you got to remember to brush your teeth and floss and, you know, gas up the car and check your bank balance. I mean, on and on and on and on. There's stuff. And there has to be something that we can do or many somethings we can do to keep an expanded sense of the interconnectedness of all things, to the interrelationship between all things, to the actual lack of divisibility between anything at all. Uh, yoga acts as a reminder and a refresher and an ever deeper dive into that consciousness. It's it's interesting. Um, also, before we started, we we were talking very briefly about because uh, I was mentioning going back to Peru and th there's a very divisive political situation there now. And 
and and I think we see that all over the world. It, uh, maybe it's always been like that, but but it seems like we're we're living in a time and uh, where things are very divisive. It, it seems like there's this kind of polarization. And interestingly, as we have access to probably more information than we ever have before, it it, it also there's an aspect of that that can also enhance that division because we can begin to really see the world through all of these different cosmovisions and kind of find uh, find this own unique cosmovision. And one of the interesting things, I mean, even the word yoga often has to do with this idea of union or, or yoking, coming to the center. The, the name of many of these, these, these sacred plants often, mm -hmm. uh, it's a similar thing. It's, it's this idea of, of union or, or, or knowledge or wisdom. Um, do you, do you have any sense that, I mean, I guess maybe it's a two part question. One, do you, do you think there is a, a division that's, that's kind of being manifested in the external world? And it also seems like with that, there is this, <clears throat> this propagation or expansion of these, these plants at the same time, which seems like an interesting coincidence. Do you, do you think the, these plants have a place in this time that that is actually very necessary and, and there's some symbiosis that's going on in the world? Well, I think that these plants have always had a place in every time since the beginning of, of human history. Um, people have clearly used these plants ceremonially and, 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 and not just ceremonially. Also, just plain to party down. I mean, if you read, um, oh, shoot, uh, the great uh, British ethnobotanist uh, who was in the Amazon, I will, I'll think of his name in a, in a moment, but, you know, he wound up in an ayahuasca event, if you will, uh, in Colombia, in which they were doing ayahuasca, they were blowing uh, psychoactive snuffs up each other's nose. Richard Spruce. They were smoking humongous cigars of mapacho. They were drinking, um, you know, insalivated fermented beverages. They were doing all kinds of things all at once and laughing and raging about and dancing. It, you know, people have used these things for a long time. And they've done so because, you know, to kind of backtrack, Cannabis is referred to as the medicine. Peyote is referred to as the medicine. San Pedro is referred to as the medicine. Ayahuasca is referred to as the medicine. Mushrooms are referred to as the medicine. These are medicines. But what do we mean by that? What do we mean? You know, it, how I think about it uh, is very much in line with what I heard a Hawaiian elder say. He said, true healing puts into order the body mind and spirit with the past, the present, and the future. If you think of healing that way, that leaves nothing out, <laughs> okay? Nothing. <laughs> the whole being, complete immersion, you know, that balance. And these agents often help to facilitate that and facilitate joy, you know? You see people say, oh, man, you know, my friends and I did mushrooms last weekend on the lake. It was the most amazing day. Okay, something joyful, something life engendering, something energizing, something that promotes an exuberance of spirit. This is what these things do. So do I think that in difficult, challenging, often violent and sometimes grim times, uh, these things have a place uh, more than ever? More than ever. What I don't like and I don't want and I resist and I write against constantly is the pharmaceuticalization of these things. Um, you know, even though LSD, for example, came out of the Sandoz labs, um, you know, it was taken up much more readily by a non-therapeutic culture, even though it had a very, very good background of use in the 50s as a psycho, you know, psychiatric agent uh, and in the early 60s. But um, fundamentally, we need these agents and we need... Um, societies that support cognitive liberty and don't tell people what they can and cannot experience in their own minds. I mean, you know, uh, Terrence McKenna once said, you know, each person, their own Magellan in their own living room. It, yeah, we definitely need these. Uh, these help to, you know, in some ways counterbalance some of the very, very difficult, challenging things that are happening all around us. Yeah. 
Yeah, th- th- that's an interesting thing. And you you alluded to this a few times, that this idea between something being a, a used in a medicinal or ceremonial or ritualistic <laughs> aspect versus this idea of, of recreation. And, and, and I think sometimes th- th- there's a lot of lines uh, between that and uh, you know, you mentioned this Richard Spruce going to the Colombian Amazon and experiencing these festivals. And it reminded me that there's a big Shipibo, uh festival. I think it's called Anishiati. And, and uh, yeah, they, they, they may take ayahuasca and they also drink copious amounts of Masato, which is a fermented right. alcoholic beverage. Um, right. <laughs> they, they're drinking a lot more of that than they are the ayahuasca. And it, it has, you know, it has an effect. It, it, it's taking them to a certain uh, altered state as well. They're fighting each other. The women are fighting the women. The men are fighting the men. I mean, they'll, they'll even have like these knives where the goal is to cut the back of the head. I mean, it, it's very un, un, unceremonial in the way that many people would think of like sitting in a quiet maloka and not talking and drinking something. And um, yeah. You know, and even that idea of recreation, it, it, it comes from this word to, to, to recreate to which that that act of creation is is the highest form of of what a human is. Some would argue it's, it's the act of being God to, to to follow in those steps of creation. So what do you think is that that balance? Um, because this also goes to to another question, which I think is, is very important that you're talking about, which is this idea of the pharmacological view of these plants, which, which I think is very vital, um, you know, Western pharmaceutical medicine is very viable and, and, and there's a, there's a place for it. Uh, but also what I've noticed is, is now kind of all of these plants are being seen through this view. I mean, even, even plants like cannabis or, or ayahuasca are being seen through this view of, well, <clears throat> they're just designed to cure you of your childhood trauma. Uh, <laughs> which there's truth to that, uh, you know, right. as you said, we, we can't be whole if we're not healed in, in body, mind, and spirit, but that, that that's not the only aspect that these plants are, are pointing towards. Look, many people, especially if, and when any of these startup pharma companies who are going through hundreds of millions of dollars of cash, like they're burning toilet paper. Um, if any of them actually wind up coming out with psychedelics and they haven't yet, Nobody is taking pharmaceutical psychedelics. Nobody, except a few people in studies. Um, If it ever happens, I do think there is an eager public that would want what they perceive as the comfort and the safety and the reliability of a medical silo, if you will. You know, uh, um, doctors or clinicians who are trained, even though, as you and I know, they don't ever have to have taken a single psychedelic in their lives, which is just ludicrous. And I think, you know, sheer hubris. But, um, you know, in a clinical setting, uh, you know, the the calm lighting, the gentle sounds, the comfy furniture, the eye shades, you know, maybe somebody holding your hand, you know, giving you water if you're thirsty. Um There are many people who will want that. And and I think that there are, um, I know this from from, uh, a dozen years of of concentrated ayahuasca ceremonies, and you know this too. Many people go with specific needs. You know, I've been dogged by this trauma from you name it for a long time. It's held me back. Uh, You know, I'm less able to experience joy than I want to. Um, And I think that, in those kinds of circumstances, and there are plenty of people who, who have that need, then places like the ayahuasca centers, like the mushroom centers, are great, great options. The aboga centers, um, you know, structured San Pedro and peyote ceremonies. Uh, I, I support all of that. Um, Lord knows, you know, my wife and I have taken hundreds of people to ceremonies in in Peru. Uh, That said, I think that the conversation over the past few years has been so heavily focused on the pharma model. You know, soon people will have psychedelics. Well, I got news, you know, millions of people are tripping every year and they haven't been waiting around for pharmaceutical startups to start cranking out drugs. Um, So, we already have access to them. People are already tripping. Probably the single biggest tripping experiment in all of human history was the 30 years of the Grateful Dead, where thousands of people at every event were tripping. 
you know, LSD and mushrooms mostly, um, and um, or Woodstock. I mean, that was probably the single largest tripping single gathering in history to this day. Um, but, you know, so I, I think that while pharma entities are understandably trying to claim turf for these things and make it seem as though this is the only safe course, that's patently untrue. It's right for some and others just want the experience of, you know, something that can generate a mystical experience. When you think about psychedelics, um, you know, ketamine, which is an anesthetic, it's very valuable for depression. It's not a psychedelic. MDMA, the old Merck 1938 methamphetamine drug that's been reborn, you know, as Molly, ecstasy, etc. It's powerful for PTSD. It's not a psychedelic. A psychedelic is an agent that engenders a mystical experience. LSD can do that. Peyote, San Pedro, you know, uh, the magic mushrooms, obviously, Iboga. These are these are true psychedelics. and um, you know, if you do them in a safe scene, you know, and setting in a, in a decent state of mind, you can have a spectacular life enhancing experience. You know, one of the best I ever had was um, the 1999 Millennium Mushroom Conference that Paul Stamets put on on Halloween weekend in 1999 at an off the grid retreat center called Brighton Bush out in the middle of the woods in Oregon. And 135 of us showed up, including Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters, uh, you know, the Shulgans, uh, some of the great herbalists and, and mushroom experts in the entire world. And we tripped our asses off on Halloween. All of us. Nobody had a bad experience. We all had an amazing time. It was jubilant. It was as though we were in this remarkable protected bubble. And it was extraordinary, and nobody was taking notes, and nobody was wearing eye shades, and there weren't any clinicians going, now tell me about your experience, and what are you experiencing right now? There was none of that. It was us having this remarkable time, and all being so wholly supportive of each other, and so all embracing, that it was just plain ecstatic from beginning to end. And we can't afford to lose that. We can't afford to lose that use. We can't afford to cede that territory to companies that you know want to take ten dollar acid and make it three hundred fifty or seven hundred fifty dollar acid, you know, in a clinical silo, that's just bullshit. So, so you know, get me going, okay? <laughs> do, do you think this pharmacological? Because a lot of people argue that this pharmacological model, uh, especially using these things and in, in what's often described as psychedelic assisted therapy is kind of a step in the progression of, okay, well, they'll be legalized for, you know, medicinal use, much like <clears throat> marijuana was. <clears throat> These psychedelics will be used in the clinical setting. And then one day, maybe they'll become legal for recreational use. Do you do you see that as uh, as likely? Or do you think once these things kind of enter the realm of, of regulation and, and working in this very specific model that that's then where they're, they're likely to stay. I think that any pharma company that gets approval to make a psychedelic will immediately hire 10 or 12 full-time lobbyists to live on K street, to fight any legislation that even hints at legalization of these things to defend their patent positions and their profits. That's what I think. I mean, I, I have worked for and with pharma companies. I've been on the inside of that animal, you know. And um, no matter what they say about it's a new day of healing, it's a brand new time for, you know, they've been saying that forever. They said that with, our, with antibiotics, which proved out to be life-saving drugs. They've said that with vaccinations, which proved to be life-saving drugs. Um, you know, but it's always with pharma, it's always, you know, a new day when they first came out with uh, SSRI antidepressants. You know, we're changing human history. I mean, the message is the same. The message hasn't changed. We're doing a brand new thing here that's going to alter the course of medicine forever, and we're going to charge a fortune for it. And we're going to go after anybody who tries to violate our patent turf because ultimately this is about shareholder value. So, you know, when you really look at the 
core DNA of greed that runs through these entities and the number of people who have absolutely no interest whatsoever in ever trying a psychedelic who are, you know, in on these things because it's clearly a potential multi-billion dollar opportunity for some entities, though a great many of these startups will wind up bleeding in the street. Um, you know, it's the same old model. There is nothing different about this. This is not a new paradigm. This is not a new anything. This is pharma doing the same old crap, getting investors, spending a lot of money, trying to get FDA approval, trying to corner the market and charge a fortune. <clears throat> you can get nice asset out there right now. You can get mushrooms from thousands of people growing them. It's totally decentralized. You know, there are <clears throat> Native American peyote ceremonies. And I know pe peyote is controversial because there is a, a problem with, you know, the endangered dimension of peyote. Um, but, you know, I, I think that mushrooms have realistically emerged as the biggest of all of the psychedelics because many thousands of people grow them Many thousands of people sell them, and they're usually very, very fine quality. And we don't need pharma to do that for us. We do not need that. Has that surprised you at all? But Because it seems like in your generation and, and a lot of people I know from that generation, you know, especially with the use of psychedelics, it seemed like there was kind of this anti-establishment worldview of questioning things, of, of, of going against norms, um, you know, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm not anti-pharmaceutical. I think pharmaceuticals have an amazing place in the world, mm -hmm. but it seems like recently the, there seems to be just this kind of blind acceptance or this idealization of pharmaceutical companies as if they're the, the end all be all, and, and they are all altruistic and, and there is no downside of them. And it seems like a lot of people who, who used to question that have, have somehow now fallen into this worldview of, of, of kind of propping up these these companies without really questioning, as you said, these these other motives, which, again, you can argue are not bad, but but they are real. Well, look, I, I mean, you know, I've spoken at many of the pharma companies. They're bright people. They're scientists all know this category very well. Um, I I agree with you that, you know, I mean, I'm not a modern medicine basher. I've, you know, been my life has been saved by modern medicine a couple of times, so I have real appreciation for it. But at the same time, um, you know, the, it is exclusive, all right? I don't expect everybody to be as idealistic as we were in the 60s where Owsley and Sands and Scully and others made LSD, and a great deal of it was free. A great millions and millions of hits were free and given out free at events all over the place. There was no profit being made for a lot of people for a long time. Um, I'm not expecting that these days. But, you know, access, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't have any friends who think that the pharmaceuticalization of these is a good idea. I don't know a soul, actually. I don't have friends who are idealizing pharma for doing this. I don't know anybody. I mean, I know Rick Doblin. <clears throat> excuse me, and he, you know, he's definitely an advocate of the pharma model and declared at the World Ayahuasca Conference, much to my surprise, that MAPS is fundamentally a pharmaceutical company, which blew my mind because I didn't think he'd ever said that before. Um, but I don't know people who are idealizing this. I know people who are just shaking their heads and going, God, that's awful. Uh, while still respecting that some people will want that clinical silo and they should have it available to them. Yeah. So when when we met, uh, we met uh, in the Amazon uh, at an ayahuasca center, and ayahuasca is a is a plant or a plant brew that that I. I has become very popular within the last mm. years. I, I remember even when I started working with it, probably, I don't know, 13 years ago or something now, uh, I was living in New York. And if I use that word, no one had any idea what I was talking about. Uh, and now people message me that every weekend there's a ceremony in Brooklyn and, uh, you know, people want to come to the Amazon. Um, 
Maybe could you you talk a little bit about that that plant to the the plant brew uh, what is ayahuasca and and how you sure. found it and and uh, maybe how it's affected you and, and also if you have any ideas of of why that plant in particular also along with mushrooms as you mentioned seem to have become so popular in in, in this time we're in. Well, I, I think that I mean ayahuasca is the only combinatory. Uh, psychedelic. That is, it takes two plants. It takes a vine, which is Banisteriopsis copy. It's a woody liana that grows in the Amazon, um, although it's being cultivated in other places now, especially Hawaii. And, and it also takes uh, Chacruna, uh, Psychotria viridis, which is a DMT containing plant. And the two of them together make this powerful, if very nasty tasting, brew. Uh, referred to as ayahuasca, and you know. Um, and it is typically drunk in a ceremonial setting. Uh, you and I have both been fortunate to spend a lot of time with people who are Shipibo, that is the, of the Shipibo tribal group uh, in Peru especially, who are particularly well known along with the Ashaninka and some other groups for their long-term uh, use and knowledge of and understanding of ayahuasca. Um, and I think ayahuasca has become so popular because it, it affects profound healings. I mean, uh, you know, I've taken a great many people to the Amazon. My wife and I have taken a great many people to the Amazon. And we don't do it for money. We, we, don't, we never make anything. It always costs us an awful lot. But, you know, we do that anyway. Um, and we've seen people... Uh, who've been dogged by something in their lives that has hurt them badly, that has held them back, uh, walk away free, whether it is depression or an obsessive compulsive disorder or, you know, a mistaken idea that they weren't loved or whatever it was, or, or you know, somehow were abused and the, the after effects of that abuse just kept amplifying through all of their relationships and all of their experiences. We've seen people healed. And word gets around, you know, people say, hey, you know, I was dealing with this awful stuff forever and I did therapy and I had a counselor and I tried this and I tried that and I was on antidepressants and I was on Xanax and then nothing worked. And then a friend told me about ayahuasca and I went down and did this thing and, you know, it changed my life. And since then, you know, you see these people come back from these situations Often, all of a sudden, they become vastly more productive and creative and expressive. And, you know, they blossom in ways that they didn't before. This gets around. Word gets out. And despite the fact that ayahuasca is, in my opinion, possibly the roughest of the psychedelics, you know, you typically throw up. Sometimes you have to urgently move your bowels as well. Sometimes, if you're really lucky, you do both. And sometimes you don't even make it to the manio. Um, you know, anything can happen. You can have very, very intense, frightening visions or glorious, expansive, marvelous, wonderful visions. Um, but it is very powerful. And I think that the transformative effects of ayahuasca, whose use goes back... We don't know how far it goes back. We have evidence that it goes back at least 1,500 years, but it probably goes back thousands more years before that. Um, it is a profound healer. And the shamans, the legitimate shamans, and there are many illegitimate shamans now, especially practicing in urban areas. And, you know, they went down and drank ayahuasca twice, and they came down. They said, I'm a shaman now. You know, the real shamans who've been trained over 10, 15, 20 years um, they are, as one shaman said to me, masters of trance. And so when they sing their healing songs and they get the ceremonies going, they help to carry you out into, you know, the wilderness of the mind and eventually kind of reel you back in with the same songs and the whole bit. These are highly skilled people who have a tremendous capacity to help to create an experience for, for people who are the pasajeros, the passengers, the people in ceremony. So I think ayahuasca has become vastly popular, especially after the 2004 um, To Hell and Back article in Nat Geo, which really blew the lid off the ayahuasca scene in Peru, uh, for all the right reasons. People get healed. 
and people tell their friends. You know, I came back from my first ayahuasca experiences um, healed of a grief that I could not get rid of on my own that was really debilitating. And I told my friends and pretty, pretty much every friend I told at one point or another said, hey, you know, I want to go down and do that with you. And then people they told and their kids and their friends said, hey, I want to go down there next time. And it's like that. Yeah. Often when people speak of of these uh, plants, they, they speak of this idea of plant spirit or plant consciousness. Um, what do you think is being spoke of when, when, when people refer to that? Because I think for... That, that's a very different worldview, and and to to many listeners, that that that's also a very foreign idea that that a plant does have a spirit or, or a consciousness to it. We we encounter, uh, I, I know, especially with ayahuasca, we encounter things. Uh, I mean, I I almost always get this giant anaconda, and many shamans consider the anaconda to be a, like a key spirit of or representation of ayahuasca. Um, why an anaconda and not a jaguar or frog? I don't know. No idea. But how it manifests to me in my experiences is, is this great big psychedelic snake. Um, other people, it's a butterfly. Other people, it's something else. Um, the spirit of plants is the essential energy of the plant. And I think that forecasting some science here that hasn't come to pass yet. Um, and a little bit of a takeoff on um, something that Jeremy Narby intimated in his book, The Cosmic Serpent. Um, everything that lives has genes. Everything that lives has a genetic makeup. And the genetic expression of all of these things uh, is broadcast through low-level proton emissions. And uh, even when the genes in something are, are, and when the something's no longer living, like a boiled medicine, like ayahuasca, in which there's no actual biological life taking place, there's still information in there. There's still genetic information. And we know from other things that I don't want to drag you through because it has to do with pathogenic uh, bacteria and food poisoning, uh, we know that genetic bits of material can translate an, uh, information to the body even when they come from non-living entities. So what I think we're going to discover eventually down the road is that what we're calling spirit is actually the aggregate genetic information of these particular plants and fungi, which is unique to those plants and fungi. Um, you know, right now we you know, oh, it's a grandmother, it's a grandfather, it's a, it's an anaconda, it's a jaguar. Whatever floats your boat, if it, if it fulfills you, if it satisfies you, if it, if it in some way, um, settles some sort of matter for you, that's great. Um, but I believe that is all interpretation through our minds, which are vast and clever and, you know, so broadly sophisticated, we still don't have a hold on that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that I think as good as anyone can. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. You're, it's the essence so of the when, thing. Sorry. Spirit is the essence of the thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when when you wrote this book, the the ayahuasca uh, test pilot's handbook. Um, <clears throat> What do you think that what was the message you were trying to convey? Uh, because I, I think it's a it's an important point is um, actually that, that people may need to know things before they begin to to work with these. these it plants. was the Boy Scout motto. Be prepared. <laughs> if you're going to go into something like ayahuasca, I'm not saying you can't just wander on into a shamanic place, sit down, slug back some ayahuasca and have a ceremony. But in my estimation, uh, there are benefits to knowing what it is, what it does. And I, I like to give essential information to people. I really enjoy that. That's something that gives me satisfaction. And, um, you know, when I started going to ayahuasca retreats and started being in ceremonies with shamans, either in those places or at their homes or someplace else, 
uh, I discovered people had a lot of questions and they were all the quest, mostly the same questions over and over again. You know, what is this? You know, it, it, all the things you'd expect. Uh, and what is this shamanic thing? And how does that work? And, you know, all of it. And so I thought, well, why not distill a bunch of that? into an easy handbook that people could carry in their backpacks. You know, I had a little bit of a tussle back and forth with my publisher. They wanted a larger format book physically. And I said, no, 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 this has to be a backpack guide. It's got to be something that they carry in their backpacks. And that large five by seven or whatever, six by nine, that's not going to do it. Um, so it's a smaller cut size book. And it really is designed to give you a kind of a crash course in many of the basics of ayahuasca, it, you know, it is in and itself not complete. Certainly, you can write about this all day and night for years at a time. But I wanted to give people the basics so that when they did go to ceremony, they had some background. And I've been fortunate that people have been very kind about it and say, oh, you know, I read your book and it made a big difference when I, you know, first went to, you know, name it, whatever, Nihui Rao, Temple of the Way of Light, Blue Morpho, whatever it is. And it, it helped me a lot. It helped me to be better prepared. And that's really the idea. Are, are there a few points that, that maybe you could mention to, to some of the listeners, things that you, you consider to be really important? Well, I think it behooves everybody to realize that shamans are not perfected saints, okay? These are people who are highly skilled, who also have life problems. You know, they may not have enough money to pay their bills or, you know, their kid's sick and they need to get antibiotics. I mean, you know, they're people having lives who are highly skilled and highly trained in assisting in these ceremonies. And do not idealize these people. Do not allow them to do things that you should not allow them to do. You know, there's been a lot of sexual impropriety in some places. Um, you know, approach these people as the genuine, legitimate experts they are, and also keep your wits about you. Um, if you're going to go someplace to uh, in, engage in ayahuasca ceremonies, well, check their reputation. There are plenty of places now online where you can find out, oh, you know, don't go to this guy, you know, all he wants to do is get into your pants, or, you know, this person promised me they'd help heal my mother, you know, invisibly over a distance, and all they wanted was money. I mean, you know, there's all that stuff. Um, and also, I, I think, you know, expect if you're going to uh, go to do ceremony, if you're going to drink ayahuasca, expect it to be very, very powerful generally extremely positively so sometimes it's a rough ride but expect that don't go in thinking it's going to be just kind of like another day at the beach because it's not going to be that for sure and be prepared to uh transform your life in positive wonderful ways and even if you know i mean I've had some of the most nonsensical experiences in ayahuasca ceremonies ever you know like these giant robotic of figures that appear and they have these huge tomato can heads. They make no sense to me. They have no meaning for me. They show up periodically. I don't know why, <laughs> you know, but at the end of the ceremonies, I'm usually feeling like really wonderfully well put together. So don't expect every single thing you see or hear or feel to somehow be like the most intelligent thing in the world or make sense because often it doesn't. Yeah. Were, were you a Boy Scout? I was a Cub Scout. And then I, I did a <laughs> couple of months of Boy Scouts, and I thought it was just, it was not for me. I thought, oh, it, it, you know, I didn't have the language then, but it came off too paramilitary, and I wasn't interested in that. I had a gas as a Cub Scout, you know, doing <laughs> stuff, you know, you get whatever merit badges for climbing a tree. I can climb a tree, you know, so... so <laughs> Were you a Boy Scout? I actually was, yeah. It, it, yeah. it, it was quite paramilitary, uh, especially because yeah. I grew up around D.C., so there was mm. a lot of uh, a lot of military sure. influence. <clears throat> yeah. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, so now one of the, the main things you, you do is, is is going around the world and, and sourcing uh, different medicinal plants from, from communities. How did you find your, yourself in, involved in that work? Well, it was a fantasy of mine for a long, long time. I had 
I had this idea that I wanted to go around the world and learn about medicinal plants. And I was interested in indigenous people, though I didn't really know anything at the time that I first developed this interest. I mean, I was not informed. Um, and, uh, you know, I shared this dream with a few people and they said things like, yeah, sure. You know, in your dreams, <laughs> it was some sort of far fetched fantasy that you could get paid to go do this, but I, I kind of stuck with it and, um, worked in the natural products industry for quite a while and eventually had the opportunity to, uh, go on a project in China, uh, in which I got to explore medicinal plants and, and, potentially work on developing a business that didn't happen. And I didn't care because I came back going, oh, I can do this and I can do this better than we just did it. If I organized this thing, I would do it this, 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 this. And immediately I was found by a company that wanted somebody to do exactly what I wanted to do. And um, that was the beginning of what has been a, a, a staggeringly privileged and marvelous career you know, um, that really took off in terms of my, my field work and my explorations as a full-time living in 95. So it's just been a, a marvelous, marvelous time. And I've gotten to go all over the world and, you know, um, be in places both, you know, wonderful and dangerous on occasion and, and remote and, and experiences that I would never be able to have if I weren't going there to investigate medicinal plants, because here's the thing about many cultures. If you, if you just show up and say nice waterfall, they go, yeah, nice waterfall. But if you're going to say, I'm, I'm interested in your most important plant, like in, in, in Vanuatu, South Pacific, when I showed up and I said, I'm interested in Kava, it was like saying, I'm interested in your God. And they couldn't do enough for me. I mean, twice they've built me houses, for God's sake. Uh, they really can't do enough. Um, you know, when I went to uh, Peru for the first time in 98 and, and said to maca growers up there, what would you think about maca uh, being a popular product in the United States? They were like, whoa, do you think that's even possible? I mean, is that just a dream or, you know, it, you, you, you get in deep with many of these people, when you express real and legitimate and sincere interest and appreciation for their most important plants, whether it's cocoa, whether it's coffee, whether it's maca, whether it's kava, whether it's ginseng, whether it's ayahuasca, you know, and then they open up their world to you, especially if you're respectful and considerate. And I am because they're the experts and I'm not. Um, so this has been a, a, a wonderful engagement for me for a long time. And I've been able to share about, uh, to back up a little bit. And the first time I lived in the Amazon uh, with Indians on the river was in uh, 97. I was there for a month living with these Ipishuna and Krinikoru Indians right on the river. I mean, actually on the river. Uh, in, in a stilt house that had water like about an inch underneath the floorboards. And um, so you walk off the front porch and throw yourself into the Amazon. And we went around meeting shamans, and they were kind of confused by that because they were like, why would you want to meet shamans? <laughs> I was like, well, because they're great healers who have a lot of knowledge. And uh, we got to this one woman, Maria Sina. She was 103 years old and sharp as a razor. She was so bright. And she looked at me and she said, you bridge the worlds. You tell people about each other. This is very important for you to do. It was like listening to a granny, you know. And uh, she said, look, you know, people don't understand each other. There's a lot of misunderstanding out there. You have to tell people about each other. So part and parcel of all of this work that I do around the world with indigenous communities is bringing back the information, the stories, the photographs, the video often, and sharing that with audiences, whether it's in, you know, popular media, um, you know, news organizations or articles or seminars and presentations to help to not only promote the use of safe, natural, 
plant-based medicines, but also to promote the interests of people who would otherwise largely go unknown, unseen, and unheard. It's it's interesting. I <clears throat> There's a guy who I have a lot of respect for. His name is Amika. It, it's a title. And he comes from a group of people called the Tubu people in the Colombian Amazon near the mm-hmm. Apaporis River. And um, for those people, they, they have a story, kind of a prophecy that, that the age we're entering, they call it, uh, um, these people, they call them the Diro Amasa. It's often translated as the children of the new dawn. Mm. And it's said that it's it's people who can bridge the medicine of the four directions to create mm-hmm. a new maloka. <clears throat> and for those who don't know, maloka is not only kind of a ceremonial house, but a living house, but it's also a representation of the earth, of the universe. So mm. it's the, these people who can bridge the, the medicine of the four directions to create a new earth. Yeah. Uh, and they say these people are kind of multicolored. You know, they're not like purely indigenous anymore. They've they've begun to mix themselves. And that's why they're able to to bridge uh, uh, worlds. And and also in, in that culture, it's very fascinating because they, they put a lot of emphasis on the story. And sure. and I think in many of the cultures we came from, there there used to be a huge emphasis on story and myth and, and folklore. And and I think we've, we've really gotten away from that. But but, you know, Amika would say things like when when you lose the story, you, you lose who you are. You, for, you forget who you are and you forget where you where you come from, that, that there's so much in view in these stories. Is that something I mean, I would imagine you, you probably didn't see yourself as that when you started. But but has that been something you've discovered is is the importance of, of this aspect of bridge keeping and storytelling now? Because it, it seems like oh, something yeah. that's actually vital. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and, you know, uh, I, I worked on a project in which we came up with a, a phrase that is sort of apropos of, of what you're saying. It's, it's one tribe, one vibe. You know, we're all one humanity. Uh, and um, there are those of us who care about being bridges, about care about bridging those worlds. You know, a lot of people ask me, I did nine years on Fox News Health around the world. And people were like, why the hell would you be on Fox News? And I say, well, because I get to address millions of people who would never hear this message otherwise all over the planet. And I'm into the big tent, what you're calling the Maloka. You know, I want the big tent. Everybody's invited. And oddly enough, I'd get comments from people from all over saying, thank you so much. I've never even heard of this. I'm going to look into this more, you know, something like that. I mean, I I didn't get negative comments about sharing psychedelics on, on uh, Fox, for example, never happened. Um, Maybe to some people's surprise. So yeah, I believe very strongly in bridging worlds uh, in creating greater understanding uh, in, you know, embracing humanity i mean whatever you know whether people are are wearing shoes or they're barefoot or they're black or they're yellow or they're white or they're whatever you know they've got some sort of particular religious background whatever it is we're all human beings here and we are all on this planet and we either contribute to a planet that thrives and prospers or we contribute to a planet that degrades and you know engenders more suffering and I'm much more interested in the former than the latter. And I think that a great many people these days uh, see that, you know, divisive models fail. Not that they're going to stop anytime soon, but they really do fail and they cause pain and suffering. And that the more inclusive we can be and the more humane we can be and the more loving we can be and the more compassionate we can be, the more understanding we can be the better world we live in. I mean, I've I've been, you know, I don't know how many Muslim homes I've been in. I don't know, dozens. I've only ever been treated with kindness and courtesy and respect, you know, and and, and in, in, you know, Syria and Lebanon and Malaysia. And I'm not just talking about like, you know, somebody's house in Dallas or something. Um, And that's, that is something worth sharing. Because right now there's a lot of, you know, anger and resentment, among, you know, about uh, people who are Muslim when really it's a, it's actually Muslim extremists who 
do a disservice to that whole religion. Um, so, yeah, bridging worlds, critically important. Being, you know, interested in all of humanity, regardless of the color creed, all of that, it's essential. Or we don't survive with or without psychedelics. We don't survive if we don't do that. When you started going to these places, did, did, did you have an idea of, of certain plants that you were interested in and, and then you, you further discovered them there? Or were there times, too, where, where you just completely discovered something new uh, by, by talking to the local people there? I have always gone. Uh, well, there are two things about it. One, I've always gone to a place, whether it's China or Siberia or Vanuatu or someplace, I've always gone with a particular plant in mind and in focus, and I'm usually serving the interests of some commercial entity that wants me to explore this plant and see if there's an opportunity to set up equitable trade. Um, but invariably, I get shown other stuff. I mean, I didn't go to Peru, for example, to take a deep dive into coca leaf, but you go up into the Andes to investigate maca, and at every turn, there's coca. Okay, so what's that about? And then you learn about that and its ceremonial uses and its daily uses and, you know, its uh, fatigue allaying effects and how everybody, you know, every hotel, any place, anywhere, and any restaurant, any place, anywhere has as much free coca tea as you can drink. So it helps you to, with altitude sickness. I didn't go for the coca. But I wound up becoming knowledgeable about coca as a result of that exposure. When I went to uh, Siberia first to investigate Rhodiola rosea, a very profoundly beneficial plant that's good for energy and vitality and reducing stress and enhancing mental clarity, I was introduced to a bunch of other plants um, by the same people, and it radically expanded my knowledge. So. I, I always go with a plant in mind and always wind up being introduced to other things. And the second thing is I never do this work by myself. I always have a group of people with me, usually a driver or a boat captain, somebody in trade, um, maybe somebody who's a local native or more than one, somebody who's a local native, if it's a native environment, um, maybe another botanist, sometimes a government agent, you know, all it's always a constellation of people. It's not me showing up like with a red cape on and going, I'm here. You know, it's, it's more a whole group of us working together to see if we can create something meaningful that will benefit people in a particular place and be good trade and be something that will help them to support their families better and eat better and live better lives and also benefit the market, which is constantly hungry for good, beneficial, health-enhancing things. What is your sense on the, the, I'm not sure what the, the word might be, but the, do you think there's, to, to what degree do you think plants have been studied by, by indigenous people and are there still plants left to be discovered? And then I, I guess to a lesser degree to, to the world at large, do you, do you think things have been saturated or there, there's still a lot to be discovered? Well, native people, <laughs> I once had this great experience. <laughs> We're up the uh, Rio Negro in, in Brazil where we met this guy. Uh, I think his name was uh, Hilbert and he was a shopkeeper and we told him we were interested in plants and he was in this little, little village off the river. And he said, I'll, I'll take you around, you know, and he took us around the forest and he showed us about, I don't know, three, four, five dozen different plants. And he would stop constantly and say, look, I'm not an expert. Okay. I'm just the guy, but you know, we grew up with this stuff. If you want a real expert, you should come back and talk with so-and-so. But the fact of the matter is he had a vast knowledge of medicinal plants really vast. It was very impressive and kind of funny too, you know, because he kept insisting that he didn't really know that much. Um, indigenous people typically know a lot about plants because they rely on the plants as foods, as medicines, as fibers to build their homes, you know, I mean, for ceremonies, you name it. So they have to know them. I have watched native guys make a backpack out of plants in two minutes 
repeatedly in the Amazon. They go, oh, wait a second, I, I need to be able to carry stuff. And they'll go to certain plants and bam, bam, bam. And you watch them make a backpack with straps in the whole bit so they can toss something, you know, pick up something, throw it into the pack behind them. A good, sturdy, solid, this isn't going to fall apart backpack. And you go, wow, holy smoke, that's amazing. Or watch women weaving, you know, roof materials for, uh, you know, palm roofs. Um, yeah, they know a lot. Is there more to discover? Certainly. Um, but they know more than anybody. The Native people know more than anybody. So rather than, you know, going to a piece of forest like Merck did in the 90s and testing every plant there and running it through high throughput machinery to see if they could find medicinal compounds, the smart money is go speak with shamans and healers. What do you use for a bad stomach? Oh, we use Carapana Uba. Let me show you Carapana Uba. You know, let me show you, oh, we got something for pain in the joints. Yeah, let me show you that. They know a lot. But yes, of course, there's more to know. Still more to know. When, when you were talking about plants, uh, you, you use this word sustainability. Uh, what do you consider important sustainable practices? And uh, not just for yourself, but but uh, I think it's it's a concern more people are having of, of themselves how to be more sustainable in, in the choices they make. Look, in a sustainable system, all parts thrive and flourish. And that is an ideal, and it is rarely a total actuality. Um, you know, in a sustainable system, for example, we wouldn't be polluting. I'm fully well aware that when I fly to Africa to work on a project, I'm flying in a jet and that's polluting. I know this to be so. I can't do this work if I don't. Um, we all make compromises. You know, you buy a pair of blue jeans someplace, somewhere. Somebody may dyes that are in those blue jeans that may not be squeaky clean organic and that potentially, uh, you know, pollutes some water someplace or creates some problem that has to be remediated. We're, we're all caught up in a world in which there are lots of, sustainability compromises. Um, but ideally, as it certainly as it relates to my world of medicinal plants, it means either wild harvesting plants in a way that they won't diminish the supply and it won't endanger the natural environment. So careful and thoughtful, and there are ways to do this, um, or cultivation of plants in a way that doesn't use toxic agri-poisons. Um, and then wage structures that enable people to do well, not just barely scrape by and, and, and have a terrible time feeding their families, but actually thrive and flourish. Uh, and I've been pleased to see some projects develop to that level of, of sustainability for people earning a living and feeding their families. Um, and then subsequently, how these plants are prepared, how they're uh, you know, what forms they're made into in ways that hopefully are non-polluting and, and um, you know, at least uh, environmentally neutral, clean and green extraction, all of that, uh, resulting in a clean, healthy product at the end, whether it's maca powder for a smoothie or ginkgo extract to help with microvascular circulation to get rid of ringing in the ears, whatever it is, uh, it's beneficial for the end user. So the entire throughput of the system, whatever it is, uh, contributes or at least doesn't take away from the well-being of the system. Um, we're nowhere near there in our society, obviously. We're enormously wasteful, especially with petroleum-based plastic products. But um, if we don't create a truly sustainable society overall for everybody, not just for privileged people in Palo Alto and, you know, Cambridge, Massachusetts, but everywhere, um, we will go down with the ship. <laughs> that will happen. There will be no other thing that will take place. So where, where, where do you see the, the future? Uh, I mean, I, I know it's hard to put on future goggles, but, but where do you see the future of, of medicinal plants moving towards? Uh, 
Because again, as you said, that this is a very old practice. It, it's as old as humanity of, of, of having a symbiotic relationship with plants. I mean, on the most basic level, I mean, we, we are in symbiotic relation. What, what we give off, plants consume. What plants give off, we consume. Right. Um, and then for a long time, it, it kind of fell out of fashion towards a more industrialized view of the world, of, of taking more synthesized things. But it seems like there is a real interest and resurgence in, in natural medicine. Do you have any sense of, of the direction that's moving, of, of how that's going to be incorporated into people's lives? Well, I mean, I think we've already seen that uh, many natural... <laughs> Chris, These are Chris, uh, oh, yeah. Sorry, your your audio just cut out for a second, but it's back oh, okay. now. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, what I was saying is, I mean, I think at this point in time, modern forms of uh, medicinal plants, you know, tablet, uh, capsules, tablets, fluid extracts, uh, these have become very common and very mainstream beverages, shots. Uh, I mean, drinking shots, not injectable shots. Um and at the very same time, we're also seeing a resurgence in the kind of wholesome sort of home preparation approach to herbalism. Uh, so people who are, you know, they're growing their own echinacea, they're making their own echinacea extracts, you know, they're providing that to friends and community, that kind of thing. I, I think we're going to continue to see a mix. Um, most people don't want to make a career of these things. You know, if they get a, an upset stomach and they know that ginger can help, they're going to get some ginger. But they don't necessarily want to have to grow it themselves and prepare it themselves. And so I think that we'll have people who are more dedicated to the category, if you will, who actively involve themselves in a more immersive way. And then a lot of people who just go, wow, it's great that I can finally get you know, a, 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 a super quality uh, matcha tea, for example. I like this stuff without necessarily having to go to Hunan and, you know, harvest it themselves and, you know, bring it on back. So I think it'll be a mix. Yeah. Yeah. One, one I think, really important thing, too, is it's interesting. Sometimes I find within these kind of, for lack of a better term, plant medicine circles or worlds, uh, there's sometimes this overlooking of these ideas of how these practices really empower indigenous people too. And, and, uh, you know, communities that have been, uh, not necessarily so well integrated, uh, into the outside world right. and, and often quite suffering and, you know, really giving people a means to, to use something that they may not be using to its fullest capacity and to really give them a means to to create a better life without having to move to the city and become a cab driver or right. you know a, a grocery store worker and to actually but because a lot of these you know I think a lot of people may not realize that a lot of these cultures are they're struggling uh, and and even this knowledge this kind of shamanic or medicine knowledge is being lost. Because the reality is there really isn't a way to, to monetize it. And, and so that knowledge is being lost that the young people don't want to learn it. They, 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 they want to have, uh, you know, a, a nice speaker system and, and live in a city and, and these things. And, and you can't blame them. You know, the, 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 the traditional for many years, life of a cordondero was very difficult, not only the training, but there wasn't a lot of money there. There wasn't a lot of outside commercial interest. So to be able to offer that people, to offer them a, a different alternative and, and one that actually empowers them to continue these traditions is, is a beautiful thing for, for, for everyone involved. Yeah. You bring, you bring up a critically important point. I mean, shamanism was dying, just dying. And all the anthropologists were saying, you know, the loss of a shaman is like the loss of a library. And, and it was just going on and on and on and on. And then began this, what people have referred to as the psychedelic renaissance and uh, and people like shipibo for example all of a sudden you could you could decide to stay and learn with your shaman uncle or your shaman mother and then hold ceremonies and earn a living and feed a family and have a good life and get that speaker system if you wanted to 
um, the revival of shamanism, maybe not the way it, it was practiced in the old days where, you know, you'd have somebody fasting in a hut on fruit pulp for two months to get rid of something. But um, shamanism has had a resurgence as a result. When, when my team and I did the uh, two years of the ayahuasca sustainability study throughout Loreto and Ukiali provinces, you know, we met harvesters who were earning a living, people who were transporting vine, earning a living, people who were warehousing and selling vine onto various commercial entities, earning a living, uh, indigenous people who were making ayahuasca finished and selling it and making a living, shamans who were practicing at places like Temple of the Way of Light, for example, and earning a living. Uh, and, and this means, you know, people sometimes idealize this category like there shouldn't be any money involved. But the fact is, it's wonderful for people to be able to feed their children. It's wonderful for people to be able to have cooking pots and wash basins. It's wonderful for them to have what they need and what they want. And um, what I see is this vast, vast web of life around all of these different uh, plants and fungi. Uh, and, and this is a good thing. So, yes, it, it, you know, the interest, let's say, that we have if we go to Peru because we want to experience ayahuasca for whatever reasons we wish to, it actually has um, a contributing effect to the the livelihood of a web, a great, large, vast web of people we may never meet. We may meet a couple of representatives of that web of life, um, but there are a lot of people behind these medicines who, thanks to our interest, and thanks to the popularization of these things, can actually feed their families now and live better lives. Yeah, that's a beautiful metaphor too. The the, the web of life. I, I I think sometimes we we can get in the habit of looking at things in a very simplistic way and, and forget about yeah. the the truly awesome in the true sense of that word, web of life, which is just the absolute interconnectivity of things is is incomprehensible um, uh, yeah. <laughs> at its root. <laughs> I've gone back to projects periodically that started off <clears throat> where I was dealing with people living in crappy conditions, wearing tatty clothing with kids who, you know, didn't have school supplies in communities that were very, very run down. And to watch over the years, to watch their quality of life improve and the kids are healthier and, you know, people have better clothing and the homes are, are better and they have electricity and, you know, toilets. I mean, things that we take for granted, you know, native people don't necessarily just love to shit in the woods. It's just what they've got. Um, and the fact of the matter is that most people appreciate comforts. Most people would prefer to live a little bit more comfortably or a lot more comfortably. I mean, my friends in Vanuatu, they still live in bamboo huts and all of that, but they're grateful for cooking pans and wash basins and knives that are sharp and, and outboard motors for their boats so they don't have to try to struggle against furious tides all the time. Um, you know, everybody should prosper in, in this equation. Everybody. Yeah. Well, Chris, this has been wonderful. Um, do you have any upcoming projects that you're working on, or anything you'd you'd like to share that uh, that that you're 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 moving towards? Well, I, I actually, I just got word of approval of a project that I can't talk about yet. But um, I'll be heading back to India in a few weeks to um, be part of a um, a group. Uh, Basically, I have a client there, an ashwagandha client, and we're going to have a bunch of people come over to India, and we're going to tour them around and show them some things about Ayurveda and about ashwagandha specifically, and also um, take them for some, you know, sightseeing with tigers and a few other interesting things like that. So that should be good. I'll be going after that to the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the International Ethnopharmacology uh, conference in north northeast india where i'll be speaking along with 
uh, a lot of other people who are speaking there. And after that, I'm not sure. Um, I may wind up getting to go uh, work on a rhodiola project in northern Germany a couple of months later. We'll see what happens with that. Sometimes, sometimes, <coughs> excuse me, sometimes these things come up suddenly. So often I don't know what's going to happen a few months down the road. And that's the situation at present. Yeah. Well, is there anything uh, you'd, you'd like to talk about that we didn't get into? I would encourage people to check out my website, medicinehunter.com. That has uh, a lot of information about medicinal plants, a lot of uh, images that I've shot uh, over the decades, and good links to, you know, different shows and to, um, and to my books. But it, I'd also like to say that um, I think anybody who's interested in these uh, in psychedelics and, uh, you know, psychedelic plants and fungi, if you have the time, uh, consider a broader dip into the world of plant medicines overall. The many, many hundreds and thousands of them that aren't psychoactive, that aren't psychedelic, but are still critically valuable and, and beneficial to health. Um, that'll just broaden your understanding of, of this whole category overall. And, and, you know, I hope that, that as many people as pursue this can do it with joy and satisfaction because ultimately this is the life we've got. We either live it well and, and happily if we can or sorrowfully. And I always prefer the, the former, not the latter. Yeah. And um, if, if people are interested in your books, is your website the, the the best option, or they can also find them at bookstores, Amazon, things like that? Yeah, you you can find the different books that I have on my website, and you can get them on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and and the predictable places. Sure. Yeah. And, and any other social <laughs> any other social media, or anything? Instagram, Facebook, oh, anything I've like got that? Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn, and um, all of those are again they're listed on my website with links to them to make it easy for people. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Well, Chris, this has been wonderful. Uh, I'm also uh, I've been in talks with uh, Zoe, and and I think we're we're going to try and schedule something in about a month. So I'm looking forward to connecting with her as well and learning more about the work she does. Um, I think we actually have a lot of mutual contacts of, of people she's helped, uh, especially women, support throughout uh, the last years, and uh, oh, she yeah. seems like she's doing great work too. So. Z yeah, Zoe's been phenomenal at, at bringing talented women forward and making sure that they get speaking positions and conferences that have been, always been all male and, um, you know, placement in some of the magazines where typically all men have written about psychedelics and making sure that there's more equality. She's been with her Cosmic Sister project. She's been a real advocate of that. So um, I think you'd find her enjoyable and I'm sure she would find you as well. Yeah. Well, I, I really appreciate this, Chris. I, I thank you for your time and, and just all the work you've done, the, 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 as you said, uh, this kind of joy of, of sharing knowledge. And I think you do that beautifully. And, and this really important role of bridge keeping, which, which I think is a, a very vital role of our time and, uh, and, and something that's, that's super important, as Amika would say, to, to create this new Maloka, to create this new earth, which, which I think so many people are sensing and wanting and, on a very deep yeah. fundamental level desiring and 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 this world of plants is is a beautiful gateway to that it's as powerful of a path or a life's purpose as anything and and there's real yeah. wisdom in there and and bridging these traditions and cultures and practices like yoga it's uh, it's beautiful what you're doing so i i uh, thank you for all of that well thank you jason it's been a pleasure and uh perhaps we'll find ourselves in the same maloka drinking some glasses of ayahuasca together you never know That'd be great. That'd be great. Well, thank you so much, my friend. All right. You take good care. Thank you. Bye now. All right, everybody. That's it. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Chris. Uh, again, it was really a pleasure for me to sit down with him, have him share in his story, his work, uh, the books he's written, uh, and just get a little more insight into him as a, as a person. Um, I, I think he's doing really great work. So it was a, it was a, a pleasure and an honor to have him on. Um, as always, if you're able to support this podcast, that's a really big help to me. Patreon is a, a really fantastic way of supporting this podcast. You can sign up for as little as a dollar a month. 
month. There's different tiers you can sign up for. Those tiers give you different things back, things like early access to shows, bonus material, Q&As, to all of the patrons, to all of the, the supporters via Patreon. As always, thank you very much for your support. I very much appreciate it. And if you're able to do that, that's a really big help in helping me uh, to bring on these guests. Uh, if you're not able to do that, some of the small things make a really big difference. So if you're uh, viewing this, the video versions on YouTube or uh, Rumble, Odyssey, uh, subscribing to the show, uh, with YouTube turning on the notification bell, liking the video, leaving any questions or comments in the comment section, all those things really help with these mysterious algorithms that are out there. And then uh, with the audio versions, uh, liking, uh, following, subscribing to the show, and then with uh, Apple Podcasts, leaving a starred rating and a short review, that makes a, uh, a really big difference. Apple Podcasts is still the biggest podcasting platform, uh, so when it does well on there, it uh, does better on the other platforms as well. So uh, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, my next guest, um, I'm not sure the exact order as I mentioned, uh, I hope to have Zoe on. Um, uh, I'm looking to have a couple of women come on who are part of the legalization of the psilocybin uh, movement in Colorado. Uh, a really interesting guy who lives in the Sacred Valley of Peru, who's very into uh, esoteric teachings and has worked with plant medicine. He sounds like a very fascinating guy, too. Uh, so there should be a number of really good guests coming up. Um, so I think that's it. Uh, thank you all again for tuning in. I hope this finds you all well, and I will see you all on the next episode. <laughs>